This is whining just a little bit, so I don't know if these mics are too close, but we thought if we each had a separate mic. Uh, you might know, uh, you should know that the LA Times did a presentation on the 100 most influential men in California. Uh, Dr. Siddiqui was one of those. Uh, he's, he's a wonderful person. We really appreciate him taking the time to come and be with us today. We're just going to talk about what we do in Southern California uh, every day of our lives. And uh, so we'll just, we, we wrote it out because we wanted to stay within our time frame and not take any of Dr. Siddiqui's time. So we'll be reading this to you. One of the goals of the Southern California Public Affairs Council of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is to become friends with the neighboring religious and ethnic communities throughout the California Southland. For many years prior to my calling in 2006, uh, I, I had been called to assist the council in, in reaching out to specific, uh, no, the council had been reaching out to specific ethnic groups and cultures, such as the African American, Chinese, Jewish, Korean, and Latino communities. So we already had an outreach before they established a Muslim outreach. Individuals have been called to work with the interfaith communities as a whole. In 2006, the council recommended to its priesthood leaders that I be called to serve as director of Muslim relations. I don't know if there's anywhere else in the church there is such a position, but we, it, it, uh, it was scary to, to receive it. Uh, I came in cold. They told me to see what we were doing with the Jewish people and all the other groups and try to develop an outreach. Uh, it must be emphasized that the council was looking for opportunities to develop positive relations with all people of Southern California. But it was felt that the best way to do this was to work with people with common interests and cultural identities. So we focused on <laughs> ethnic groups to, uh, to have our focus. We do not seek to favor any ethnic group over another. Those selected for our focus were those major ethnic groups in the area where we felt we could possibly have the most influence. Previous to our calling, there were other LDS leaders reaching out to the Muslim community. I spoke with a stake president who had invited a Muslim community to use their nearby stake center for their Friday prayers for over a year while they rebuilt their mosque after a fire. A stake in the San Diego area permitted neighboring Muslims to use their facilities to celebrate the end of Ramadan. Members of the church in Pasadena joined with the Muslim community at the stake center in preparing 10,000 family hygiene kits for relief of the people in Iraq. One of our LDS institutes reserved a room for Muslims from the adjacent college to have their noon prayers. A local bishop and two members of the Orange County Public Affairs Council were well loved by the Muslim community because of their extensive service to them. We were grieved by the fact that two of these brothers died with cancer just as we came on board. The third, Tom Thorkelson, is still very much involved in the Orange County interfaith activities. So this was not the beginning of the outreach to the Muslim people. We, the church has been doing it for many years previous to formalizing it in, in my call. When called to this position, I had just been released as bishop of a local Latter-day Saint congregation and was hoping to be called as a Sunday school teacher or something with even less responsibility. But that was not my fate. Prior to my call to be bishop, my wife and I had served a full-time mission for the church serving with the Southern California Public Affairs Council. And while I served as bishop, my wife continued serving with interfaith community, and by default, I assisted her. Likewise, she plays a vital role in my service to the Muslim people. So we were involved with interfaith work and knew a few Muslims, but we had little contact with the Muslim community as a whole. Previously, our only encounter with Muslims was while teaching for Brigham Young University in Jerusalem, where we developed friendships with many wonderful Jewish and Muslim people. Some of our members of our LDS congregation expressed fear for our lives. <laughs> they were afraid our lives would be endangered by our association with Muslims, whom they saw as potential terrorists. We were a bit anxious the first time we entered a mosque, but the people there welcomed us with open arms. After my calling was announced, 
I was immediately invited to speak to the Islamic Shura Council of Southern California, a federation of about 80 mosques in Southern California. This body made me feel at home and soon filled our calendar with invitations <coughs> to Muslim events. At that time, Dr. Siddiqui, was on, who's on the stand here, was chairman of the Shura Council. What kinds of things have my wife Judy and I been doing with the Muslim community during the last four and a half years? I calculated from the records I've kept during four of the years since our calling that we've attended more than 282 events with these good people. I was asked to speak, sometimes spontaneously, uh, at many of these events. Often, I've been asked to pray. Most often, it has been recognized from the stand that, quote, we're happy to have Bishop Gilliland and his wife Judy from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with us. They were very gracious to us whenever we came and recognized us and made us feel at home. Just four days ago, we joined with nearly a thousand Muslims in a benefit din dinner sponsored by the Islamic Relief Association to aid the people of Libya. We had purchased seats at a table in the back, but when the head of Islamic Relief saw us, he moved us to the front table beside him and with the speakers. And he took the time in his introduction to welcome us and told the audience about all of the support LDS Humanitarian Services gives to Islamic Relief. Many people, young and old, afterwards came up and thanked us for attending and for what our church is doing to help them. They said, we will not forget. That made an impression on me. This is the kind of reception we have received time and again throughout these last four years. We know that they are not honoring us. They are honoring our church and the good that it does. But you can see why it's such a pleasure to serve <coughs> with these wonderful individuals. At most of these events, we're the only non-Muslims present what do we do there? Besides learning, being inspired, and visiting, the thing we most do most often is eat. We've recorded attending more than 129 dinners. Now I know why I have trouble losing weight. During Ramadan, we've been invited to more dinners than we could possibly attend. This should give you a feel of how gracious these wonderful people are. Giving is not only a part of their faith, but it seems to be part of their nature. I was worried when first called because of our limited budget. Other religious groups we've worked with require us to pay for every activity we attended. We found that the Muslims didn't ask, how much can you contribute to us? But they said, what can we share with you? We've been given five major awards by the, by the Muslim and interfaith communities because of our service. We're not accustomed to this kind of attention. Certainly any, any honor that's been given should be to the compassionate, merciful God that we all worship. Breaking bread with our Muslim friends has given us <clears throat> opportunity to network with leaders of mosques and Islamic organizations such as the Muslim Public Affairs Council, the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Iranian Muslim Association of North America, Islamic City, Access, and many others. We have eaten with many reporters and editors of newspapers that serve this community. Articles about LDS Muslim relations have shown up in their newspapers. For many years, I've been a member of the Christian Muslim Consultative Group, which strives to build positive relations between Muslims and Christians. This has expanded my contact with other Christians who are likewise trying to develop interfaith understanding. Each stake in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints consists of several congregations. Within the stake organization is a public affairs director and his or her committee who work with the congregations of the stake. Multi-stake direct public affairs directors are called to train and consult with the stake directors. The multi-state directors and the directors of the ethnic groups and an executive committee make up the Public Affairs Council of Southern California. We meet collectively three times a year and are often individually in communication by telephone and email. Our executive committee meets monthly. At each level, this organization is guided by priesthood leaders who advise and approve our activities. It is through this organization that we are able to communicate with church leaders and members. For instance, each year the Masajids uh, of the Shura Council invite their neighbors 
to attend an open mosque day, which consists of presentations on Islam, question and answer sessions, <coughs> and excellent food. Through our state public affairs directors, we let our LDS members know of these Muslim open houses. Large numbers of Latter-day Saints attend them throughout the Southland. Judy and I each year have visited four different mosques on that particular day, and many times when we show up, we, we find out that there are more Mormons there than any other faith group uh, attending and, and learning and enjoying the experience. In fact, uh, uh, frequently after this the open mosque day for weeks, I have members coming up and saying, thank you for letting us know about this. That was wonderful. We really learned a lot. Uh, we found that our fellow members are hungry to find out the truth about our Muslim friends. A few years ago, our daughter and family were visiting from Texas just at the same time that open mosque day was occurring. So they took their five children to the Islamic Society of Orange County. Following the tour and presentations, our grandchildren were very interested in the delicious array of, uh, and variety of ethnic foods that were presented. Someone, though, had also brought a large tray of fresh donuts. When his parents told him he couldn't have a second donut, our grandson Chandler commented, I like Muslim food. <laughs> Um, each year, we have encouraged our LDS congregations to invite their local masjid or mosque to break the fast with them during Ramadan, the holy month when Muslims fast each day during the daylight hours. This past year, four of our stakes invited their Muslim neighbors to join them in a break the fast meal. In each case, the Muslims insisted on hosting the event and providing the food. Dr. Siddiqui's mosque was one of those that hosted us. At each event, the local LDS leaders spoke to the attendees about fasting in the LDS faith, and the Muslim leaders spoke on fasting with, within Islam. This was the first time most LDS members had ever been in a mosque. These were evenings enjoyed by all. One imam asked, do you know what we Muslims call Mormons? We call them Muslim Christians. Also, many masjids invite their local churches to join with them in a special iftar, or fast-breaking dinner, one evening during Ramadan. We know of at least 10 mosques that were visited by their local LDS congregations for the interfaith iftar that, this past year. Judy and I have flown up to Utah with four different groups with Muslim leaders on two-day trips to Salt Lake City and BYU. The, the excellent public affairs hosting staff conduct an outstanding VIP tour of church facilities. Our public affairs council also provides tours for Jewish, Catholic, and other interfaith groups. In my opinion, nothing else we do in public affairs gives leaders a better insight into the values and teachings of the church and what it does worldwide than this trip, these visits that we've done. Just last week, we came with six uh, uh, Muslim leaders. Um, they were not only impressed with what the church does, but our people were very impressed with them. Uh, the bridge of understanding flows both ways. And that's part of our purpose, is not just to introduce them to the church, but to bring them in, in touch with church leaders and with BYU professors and others that they meet with. And they're very impressed with the good people that are leading the uh, Islam in Southern California. At a dinner in California last year, a person sitting next to me said, our imam went with you over a year ago and he won't stop talking about what a wonderful, the wonderful things you Mormons are doing to help those in need throughout the world and that we should be following your example. We've taken the leadership of various mosques on tours of our local bishop storehouses in our area. The bishop storehouse is a resource center for the LDS community leaders in providing welfare, humanitarian service opportunities, employment training, and social services counseling. Our guests usually return to their masjids with a stronger commitment to provide similar services in their own communities. The LDS stake president is the primary leader over six to eight congregations or wards within a geographical area called a stake. We have provided the opportunity for many of our stake presidents to each go to lunch with his local mosque <coughs> leader. Besides getting acquainted with each other, they have begun a discussion of how the two faiths can work together. This has opened doors for future activities. For instance, I received a telephone call from the UMA clinic 
which is a local clinic run by Muslim doctors from the UCLA Medical School, which provides medical help to all of the people in the most poverty-stricken areas of Los Angeles. The clinic tries to work with families to help them improve not only their health, but also their quality of life, including education. They give children's books to the parents with a doctor's prescription to read together with their children every single day. We had in the past sponsored a drive amongst Latter-day Saints that provided books for the doctors to give out to those families. Thereby, I received a call from the uh, person from the clinic requesting help for the local elementary school. Uh, the LA school district had so severely cut back its school's budget that the basic materials such as pencils, spiral notebooks, rulers, crayons, etc., were not available for the children and the parents were too poor to purchase them for their families. Many discouraged children were dropping out of school and turning to drugs and gangs. The clinic asked if the LDS could work with them to gather basic school supplies for the children. I said yes, we'd work on it. But first I contacted the local mosque. I contacted the Imam of the Islamic Center of Southern California and asked if he would be interested in a humanitarian activity for his youth and for the Latter-day Saints youth in this area. He responded warmly. I then called the leaders of two local stakes, the presence of which had had previous luncheons with the local Imam, and so they're already familiar with, with the community. And they both said, yes, we would love to have a, a youth service project to help the needy uh, children in Los Angeles. On December 4th, 2010, more than 200 Muslim and Mormon youths met at the 68th Street School in South Central Los Angeles and brought many van loads of school materials that they had collected during the past month at their various congregations. The youths assembled the materials into backpacks donated by Costco <coughs> and other local businesses. These were combined with school packets requested by one of the stake presidents from and donated by LDS <coughs> Humanitarian Services. The 68th Street School provided a fair where the students visited 20 booths sponsored by agencies that service the local community. Some of the booths at the fair included the UMA Clinic, the library, legal aid, financial help, and things like that. As the children and their families visited and learned from each booth, they had a card stamped. Receiving 20 stamps on their card helped them earn a backpack of school materials provided by the Mormon and Muslim youth. After assembling the school materials and while the volunteers passed out the backpacks to the school children, the Mormon and Muslim teens, uh, teens played, a, played a get acquainted mixer and then they had a discussion about the similarities in belief and practices among Latter-day Saints and those who follow Islam. A question and answer session followed where they asked some very blunt questions of each other and, and the youth responded to each other. It was a very uh, exciting experience. The, the youth left feeling good about their service project but also with new friends of a different faith. We've been called to build friendships between the Latter-day Saints and the Muslims. In challenging times, Friends help friends. Latter-day Saints are familiar with prejudiced campaigns in some communities to prevent the Mormons from building new temples or new chapels. I could give you many examples of this happening as we speak. The Muslims are often confronted with similar prejudice and misinformation and strong opposition when they try to build a new meeting house for their families. Steve and I, as individual citizens, and local LDS church leaders spoke favorably about our Muslim friends before the Lomita City Council in support of them remodeling their mosque on property that they themselves have owned for over 30 years. A small but loud and angry group of people have been able to thus far intimidate the Lomita City leaders to turn down these Muslim requests. The Lomita Muslims are disappointed but have not given up and will continue to have our support. In Temecula, a group who referred to themselves as Christians <clears throat> organized protest rallies at a mosque which was planning on constructing a building. They rallied with loudspeakers and banners and attack dogs across the street from the mosque during their weekly Friday prayers. Hearing of this, a member of the LDS stake presidency mobilized LDS members and leaders from the local interfaith council 
to come wearing white shirts and blouses with signs saying, friend of the Muslims. They quietly stood around the building, facing off the ranting protesters, while the Muslim families knelt inside in their weekly prayer service. The LDS also later spoke to the Muslim congregation and also to their youth group, telling them not to be intimidated or embarrassed about practicing their faith, that Mormons understand because they have felt the heat of persecution and distortions of their own faith. And these same LDS then spoke in defense of the Muslims, along with many from other faiths, in a very long, rancorous city council meeting. But the city council finally approved the building of the mosque. We all rejoiced at that. After vandals desecrated an Islamic display in Mission Viejo, the Council on American-Islamic Relations invited me, along with city officials and mosque leaders, to speak to, to the Mission Viejo Muslims and to encourage them to stand up for their values and not let those who are bigoted intimidate them. I told them that I know from experience that to know the Muslim people is to love them. I said, please help your frightened and, confu and confused neighbors get to know you so that they will learn to love you. As you know, there are many distortions and lies circulating on the internet about both the Muslims and the Mormons. Because of my calling with the Muslims, I also receive many anti-Muslim emails forwarded to me by my LDS friends wanting to know the truth on this and how do they respond to this. I frequently spend many hours a week addressing them uh, with help from my Muslims who are more knowledgeable than I. My Muslim friends often tell me of instances where they stand up and oppose prejudice attacks on the Mormons uh, with their neighbors. When people were marching to demonstrate against the Los Angeles LDS Temple, protesting Proposition 8, my close friend uh, Shaquille Syed called me on the phone. Shaquille is the head of the Islamic Shura Council of Southern California. He said, Brother Steve, we are sad about what's happening at your temple. Say the word and I will bring a large group of Muslim leaders and we will stand with you side by side to face off those people and show our support for you and for Proposition 8. We have found that one of the most effective me, uh, means of bringing Mormons and Muslims together is through joint humanitarian activities. Last Saturday, hundreds of women from the Women's Relief Society of the North Torrance Stake gathered at the stake center with women from the local mosque to assemble donated materials for needy women and children in Los Angeles County. Steve and I were among those asked to speak. We're aware of many similar projects involving men and women and families. In some cases, the men were excluded so that the women could remove their scarves, letting their hair down, and make quilts together. Besides fasting and righteous living being encouraged during the month of Ramadan, Islam encourages its followers to give generously to the poor and needy. A Muslim organization sponsors Humanitarian Day in many major cities in California, where the youth and young adults pass out food and basic supplies to the homeless, destitute people living there. Many have children that they bring with them. The youth are trained to welcome the needy guests with dignity and warmth. It is touching to see these youths in the hot sun while fasting themselves from food and drink passing out food and water to the needy. The LDS Church donates large amounts of hygiene kits, infant kits for the young mothers, and school bags for the children for this project. Mormon youth and young adults and their leaders and full-time missionaries are invited to come and help with these humanitarian days. Steve and I have participated during the last four years and have helped train the volunteers with the help of some of our <coughs> priesthood leaders. Muslims have two major Eids or celebration during the year, one at the end of Ramadan and one celebrating the willingness of Abraham to give up everything, even his son, to God. Judy and I sent Eid cards to about a hundred of our Muslim friends during each of those celebrations to help us stay in touch and to let them know of our love for them. The Mus Muslims have been supportive of many of our community and interfaith activities. When President Thomas S. Monson, then a member of the First Presidency, spoke to the Los Angeles Rotary Luncheon, there were a number of tables with Muslims present. 
When the LA Temple Visitors Center was recently re rededicated by Elder Russell M. Nelson, the majority of the 30 interfaith leaders present were Muslim. When Elder Dallin H. Oak spoke a few weeks ago at Chapman Law School on religious freedom, Muslim leaders were on the front row. It impressed me that before the program, when he came to the stand, Elder Oaks came to the stand and looked down and saw the Muslim leaders, he ushered his wife off of the stand. They came down and embraced and shook hands with the, the Muslim leaders. And on his way back up to the stand, I, I stood up and shook his hand and I said, thank you for greeting our, our Muslim friends. And Elder Oaks said, they are our natural allies in the fight for religious freedom and morality. What challenges do we face in our work with the Muslim communities? A major challenge is that Islam is so diverse. In Southern California, we have Muslims from various Arab countries in the Middle East, from Egypt, Libya, Afghanistan, and various countries from Af the African continent, from India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Iran, Turkey, the Philippines, Bangladesh, Thailand, and many, many other countries and cultures. We have a large population of African American and Latinos who are Muslim as well in, in Southern California. We have Sunnis, Shias, Sufis, and a multitude of groups who have broken off from these larger Islamic groups. Believing in the Quran and following the five pillars, each group has its own interpretation <coughs> of God's laws. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one thing that um, has been something that I learned was that I always carry a scarf in my purse so that I don't go off and forget it because uh, it's important to, um, for a woman to cover her head during prayers. And so I have my scarf with me so that when sacred scriptures are read from the Quran or when um, they have their prayer service, I can cover my head. I'd observed that most women come in pants with a longer uh, dress or a longer top over it. But a week ago, we slipped into a mosque that we hadn't been to before. and. Um, at this particular mosque, the women went in one door and were in a separate room, and the men went in another door. And so I went in, and as I looked around, I was a little bit embarrassed because even though I was modestly covered and I had, I had on long pants and a shorter jacket, um, they were all wearing long dresses and coats. And I was very embarrassed, and I was afraid that I was offending them by uh, not dressing properly. So I apologized to one of the women, and uh, all the women around me just assured me that everything was fine and that they were glad I was there, and I didn't need to be uncomfortable about that. Different cultures <coughs> bring different dialects, making it hard to understand and so sometimes what people are saying. Unusual names make it hard for us to remember them, and I have trouble remembering any name, let alone the, some of the unusual names that we find from all these different cultures. And so I've Googled out, uh, whenever we meet someone, I Google out, sometimes we can get their picture on the internet and, and put their name under it, and every time we go to a Muslim event, Judy and I are going over names and faces because we've met so many people, and we, we want to acknowledge them when we see them again. Um, but uh, everybody makes us feel at home no matter what and are very sympathetic to, to our, our plight. At times, Muslim leaders have asked us to speak out on politically controversial issues. Even though we may personally agree with some of these issues, we have to be continually on guard not to imply that the church supports a position on which it has not taken a stand. We have had to avoid some events and press conferences that would misrepresent the church even though we personally may support the issue promoted. Experience has taught us that reporters and promoters don't listen well or report accurately. We are often being asked about statements by politicians or talk show hosts who belong to the church and project an Islamophobic point of view, who promote hate and misinformation about Islam. Many of them either seem to be liars or ignorant but some of them don't seem to be ignorant. Although we don't have a TV show, and we don't carry a blog, have a blog or carry a megaphone, we do hope that our personal example will overcome some of these misimpressions 
and clear up some of the confusion about our church's attitude about our brothers and sisters in Islam. In summary, <clears throat> our biggest challenge is ignorance. But we have found that most Mormons and most Muslims we've, <clears throat> we've met want to understand the truth about each other. A few years ago, we took a busload of interfaith leaders to the Redlands Temple open house. A trio of Buddhist monks in their bright orange robes were just exiting the temple. And, and uh, they made such a beautiful picture there with the backdrop of the temple. And so I asked them to stop so I could take their picture. And while I'm busy focusing in that, a sweet little LDS lady came up and she says, oh, that's such a nice picture of those Muslims. And uh, so I gently explained, well, actually, they're not Muslims. They're Buddhist monks. Oh, I didn't know that, she said. Well, a few years ago, I would have said nearly the same thing. Um, when we started this in adventure together, we didn't know that much either. But people have been patient and kind to us, teaching us gently and lovingly of new ways to understand one another. Daniel Peterson spoke at a fireside uh, on Mormons and Muslims in Orange County. And following the meeting, we pulled together a group of LDS uh, leaders of youth and, and Muslim leaders of youth to talk about having some activities together. And two of our young women's leaders enthusiastically suggested that we should have a dance for the teenagers to get acquainted with each other. There was silence on the part of the Muslims for a little bit. And then they, they informed the, the people that, uh, um, that Muslims don't participate in activities where there's contact between the sexes. This was a new ground for all of us as we explored each other's activities so that the youth could, could do things together. And so we, we, we were learning from each other. And the Muslim people have been very patient with us in our, in our mistakes. Oops, last page. We have found that faith in God and love are the most basic principles in both of our religions. We feel the spirit of God and a strong desire to follow his teachings among people of both faiths. We feel the spirit of love both within their communities and in their reaching out to us. Our calling to work with the Muslim people has increased our optimism about the future of this old world. It has reinforced our own faith and increased our commitment to live our own religion more fully. We have been truly blessed through our experiences with the Muslim people. Thank you. Good afternoon and say assalamu alaikum. Peace be to all of you. Um, Steve and Judy has uh, almost taken all the practical aspect of my speech. So <laughs> you've been doing all the things that I've been talk I was going to say that uh, uh, Muslim and modern relations are the model. <clears throat> I wish to thank uh, Dr. Boyd Peterson. Uh, Utah Valley University and the Mormon community for your very kind invitation. I hope this meeting will be beneficial for strengthening our bond and our mutual relationship. The relationship between our two faith communities, as mentioned already, you have heard this full presentation here, uh, is, uh, is good. But just as we have to keep a watch on our health through proper diet and exercise and watching of viruses and all of these things, we have to keep an eye on our relations as well. Misunderstandings, suspicions, and fears destroy deep friendships and even blood relationships. What to say about relations between the people of diverse faiths and traditions. A pluralistic society is a society in which people of diverse religions, ethnicities, and cultures live together. They are considered full citizens with equal rights and responsibilities. The question is how they can live together in peace and harmony with differing faith claims and loyalties, sometimes maybe competing faith claims, 
and what they should do to be authentic to their own faith traditions and also work together with others to make a strong, safe, progressive and prosperous society. As a Muslim, I would say that this requires both a theological perspective of human diversity and an ethical plan for peace and justice for all people. The world in which we live is rightly called the global village. In order to have harmony and peace in this world, we must emphasize unity in diversity. We have to promote a multi-civilizational and multi-religious arrangement of our world. It is not only that people in different parts of the world are diverse, but now we have a lot of diversity in our own cities, towns, indeed in our neighborhoods. People who live next door to us are often very diverse in colors, cultures, races, and religions. I'm pleased that there are many people who are thinking and exploring ways and means to develop a, a society where people of diverse faith and cultures can live together in peace and harmony. American democracy is built on the principles of unity in diversity. To a great extent, we can say that in modern times, United States presents a fairly successful example of such unity in diversity or what is known as pluralism. First, I would like to say that in this multi-faith and multicultural world, or what is called as the pluralistic society, the paradigm of developing a mosaic is much more appropriate than a paradigm of making a melting pot. We should have the environment of freedom to be whatever we want to be while working together towards a more assimilated society. This approach can, be, can bring more harmony and peace. Besides this, we can also emphasize that we human beings have much more that unites us than that which divides us. The problems sometimes come when people start thinking we have nothing in common with others. They are totally different from us and we are different from them. We are good, they are evil. We must defeat the others and we must control them. The notion of clash of civilizations is also neither correct nor helpful in building a pluralistic society. Civilizations are not solid monoliths. They are, there are varieties and diversities within each, each civilization. Let me uh, say a few words about uh, the theological perspective of Islam on unity and diversity. First of all, first of all uh, we emphasize that there is only one God. So our Creator is one and the same. God has many names. Allah and God both name comes belong to the supreme being Jews Christian and Muslims believe in the same God Elohim Allah and Allah these names share the same Semitic roots they are cognates the Quran says to the Christians and Jews your God and our God is one and the same in the chapter 29 verse 46 and also God created all human beings from the same parent. So Adam and Eve, all human beings are related to one another and are members of one and the same extended human family. Jewish people say that human beings are created in the image of God. Christians say that humans are God's children. Muslims say that humans are deputies and representatives of God on this earth and are brothers and sisters to each other. Chapter, one, chapter 4, verse 1. So you have 
different ways of expressing this. Whether you say man is created in the image of God or children of God or you say brothers or sisters actually say, saying the same thing. The state is we are all related to each other, we are all connected to each other. Human beings have been given differences of colors, languages and races. The diversity is beautiful and enriches life with, with varieties of cultures. The Quran emphasizes that diversity is a sign of God's love and creative power. It is not a curse. The Quran says in chapter 30 verse 22, among his signs is the variation in your colors and in your languages. So that is among the signs of God, God's creative power that people have different languages and people have different colors. And, uh, but all human beings, regardless of their races, colors, genders or religions are equal and deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. Life, freedom, honor of every person should be protected. Quran says God has honored human beings. It does not say God has honored Muslims, God has honored men, or God has honored people of one particular area, particular race, but it says, We have honored all the children of Adam. And that is in chapter number 70, 17, verse 70. Life of every person is sacred. Killing of one innocent person is like killing the whole humanity. And saving one life is like saving the whole humanity. As the Quran says in chapter 5, verse 32. The law of Islam, which is called the Sharia, the basic values of the Sharia are, as emphasized by almost all Islamic schools, are protection of life, protection of freedom, family, dignity, property, and religious freedom of every person. And uh, throughout history, God has guided human beings through his various prophets and messengers. Their messages were basically, the Quran emphasizes again and again, the messages of all the prophets were to worship God and avoid evil. And Abdullah which Sanibut Taghut. This is the core message of the prophetic teachings. So wherever there is goodness and virtue, it is from the same source. Actually, as Muslim I can say that uh, if I see similarity in other traditions, I feel very happy. For me, this is not a problem when we see similarity in, in, in uh, one tradition or the other tradition. The problem is why there is diversity, why there is, why, why there is a difference, why there are different things. So then we have to come to some explanation of that. But similarity means that there is the same source and because of that source there have to be similarity. Wisdom is the common property of all human beings and we should be open to learn from each other and cooperate in the matters of goodness and piety, not sin and aggression. Chapter 5 verse 8 in the Quran. The ta'awun wal al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awun wal al-ismi wal udwan Cooperate with each other in the matters of righteousness and piety and do not cooperate with anyone in the matters of aggression and sin. God commands us to live with and spread peace, justice and righteousness in the world. The Prophet Muhammad said, all creatures are God's dependents. The most beloved to God is the one who is the most kind to his dependents. So here is also there is emphasis that one should be kind and good towards all people. Now, on the basis of these, uh, some theological principles uh, that can be elaborated and one can give, spend hour and hour on that discussion, the, every one of them, uh, one can take a, some kind of an ethical plan, plan of action. First of all, we need better education about each other. We should have more interfaith and cross-cultural dialogue. 
Our biggest problem is that most of us know very little about each other. Even when we know, even what we know is often mixed with a lot of misinformation, prejudice, and stereotypes. The Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. The Quran says, be fair, that is next to piety. We, however, have done the opposite of what we are taught and what we preach. We must eliminate the hate propaganda from our societies, especially Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, racism, and bigotry. We must be united to support the human rights and dignity of all people. We must denounce all forms of violence in the name of any religion or ideology. We should do everything we can to prevent the spread of violent extremism, radicalism in the name of any faith, including our own. We must affirm the sanctity of each other's houses of worship and should stand together in cases of an assault on any house of worship, church, mosque, or synagogue. We must respect the sacred symbols and scriptures of each other's religion. When we disagree, we should express our disagreement in a peaceful and a decent manner. As the Quran has taught us, that is, وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنٍ even when you argue with the people, you argue in the nice manner, in a courteous manner. We should help the members of each faith community to practice their respective faith without any discriminatory rules or regulations. I think this is in a pluralistic society, it is important that people of all faiths should be free to practice their religion and actually people of other faith can help the people of a faith to practice their faith. Uh, so in that sense, that is, uh, we can build this uh, relationship on these grounds. As far as uh, Mormons and Muslims are concerned, you heard a full uh, report about what is happening, especially in Southern California. I consider the relationship between Mormons and Muslims as a model of interfaith cooperation and collaboration. Our communities are very diverse and have some major differences in our theologies, but our differences have not kept us away from each other. We have discovered that we have many things in common. Our ethical and moral commitments are very similar. We emphasize a life of sobriety. I wish we were not taking tea also, but uh, uh, certainly we are uh, uh, emphasize very much that is uh, the avoiding of alcohol, alcoholic privileges and drugs and all of this is yes, it's a very common thing in our us. We cherish divinely ordained fa family and emphasize good care of children and relatives. Certainly we stand together on this issue of uh, marriage, what it means and uh, what is the divinely sanctioned and divinely ordained family system. Both of our faith communities are committed to charity and working to remove human suffering. We have developed good cooperation in relief work in many countries. Muslims and Mormons are working together to improve the textbooks. We will be hearing more from Brother Shabir Mansour, he was here, working together for a long time to improve the textbooks used in our schools throughout the country by correcting the misinformation, not only about our own two faiths, but about other faiths as well. We are very thankful to Brigham Young University for developing an excellent program for teaching Arabic to non-Arabs and creating some new ways of teaching Arabic to non-Arabs and also making available many classical Arabic texts on religion and philosophy with careful translations. The translations are very good, very accurate, and very careful. We are also working together to remove misinformation and misunderstanding about each other through regular meetings and interfaith programs and activities. The credit for initiating 
these contacts and collaborations often goes to Mormon leaders, and I appreciate that very much. I thank very much for your work, for your support, especially uh, uh, in, the, in the relief work, uh, with, when tsunami hit Indo uh, Indonesia, and when uh, earthquake took, happened in Pakistan, in many other places, uh, the people from the Mormon community were in the forefront and, and spent millions, actually, in, in contributions. Thank you very much, and God bless you for that. Um, Muslims also have been willing partners and supporters. Uh, both of our communities have been facing many challenges in this country, and uh, I think whatever challenges are there, uh, that is uh, misunderstanding, misunderstanding, misinformation, stereotypes. Uh, today is the day when there is a hearing take, taking place in Congress. And uh, so these kind of challenges are, 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 are there. And it is very important that uh, we uh, support each other, we work with each other. And uh, whatever support you are giving, I, say, I would must say that on behalf of myself, on behalf of uh, many organizations that I belong to, that we are very appreciative for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, before I open it to questions for about five minutes, um, just a reminder, there's a reception tonight. Uh, you are all invited. Uh, there will be food, warm and cold, but it's not a dinner. It's more in the uh, Mormon and Muslim culture, bringing you together to eat and talk. And so that's one of the great commonalities between our two faith traditions. So that will be in this uh, building, room 206. Is that correct? All right. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, these three will be involved in a panel discussion in, in, in just a few minutes. However, we have five minutes where you could focus in on uh, a question or two, should you have any, um, for this trio of public affairs experts in Southern California, um, and by extension throughout the world in, in very real ways. Your questions, please. I'm taking it to Brian. He's the ultimate authority on that question. All right. <laughs> I didn't realize I needed a microphone runner. Yes, the entire conference will be available online, uh, uh, we hope, within a couple of weeks. So as you can see, we're recording. Uh, as I'm learning, it takes longer to edit and process than, uh, than would be ideal, but uh, we hope to have it up. So the, the conference website, uh, is pretty easy to get to if you go to the UVU website and just do a search on uh, Mormonism and Islam. It'll take you to our site, and we should have the uh, flash player with the conference up. Uh, probably, I'll try to commit to two weeks uh, to be safe. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me, and my email address is on the website too. It's a bold commitment, Ryan. Other questions, please. It sounds like the Gillilands get a lot of the same hate email that we do. And I would very much like to have a rebuttal. If you have one, I will give you my email address. You can forward it to, and I will be happy to pass it along to everybody in my, okay, great. You know, I'm, I'm tired of these please forward to everybody you know, and it's so full of hate, and I try to, straighten them out. I've been reading everything that I can to educate myself about 
the Arab, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian dispute over the years, uh, everything intellectual, anything historical, fiction, whatever it takes to become more educated and more loving and more um, diplomatic as well. Thank you. Question. So impressive to hear what's happening in California. Are similar things happening in Utah? We're doing a conference. <laughs> I know that there is a round table in Salt Lake. Interface round table, yes. There is an interfaith roundtable in Salt Lake, and the Muslims and Mormons do a lot together. Um, we've met some of the Mormon Salt Lake leaders when we've come and brought leaders from Southern California. They've uh, participated in a dinner with us so that uh, the Salt Lake Muslims could also see the Southern California Muslims. And um, I know that they are very active up there. You have. Uh, I think organizations on campus here as well as at Brigham Young University uh, among the students. And I've heard that there's a mosque being built here in the Provo Orem area. Um, so there, is things, there are things happening and I would really urge you to find some of your Muslim neighbors and make friends and um, it, it's really taught me a lot more about my own faith and, and ways that I can live my faith more fully as I've seen their examples. I'll just give you two real quick ones. Um, in their prayer halls, uh, we remove our shoes before we go in there uh, because this is a sacred space. But also they read from the Quran in there. And you know, I go to Sunday school and I take my Book of Mormon and slip it under the chair on the floor and because it's, so it won't be in the way. But they have little stands that, to place God's word on the stand so that it's not touching the floor. That's how much they respect the Quran. And it's made me a little more aware that I need to be a little more respectful of my own scriptures and treat them a little better. Uh, one of the things we did with the Muslim leaders last week was uh, tour Welfare Square and we had explained about the fast offerings and how this whole facility was being used to produce food and other things for the poor. And at the end of the tour, <coughs> excuse me, we get to sample the cheese and the honey and the bread and the chocolate milk um, to show what was produced there and the quality of it. And one of the young Muslim leaders after partaking, as we're walking down the hall, he said, now wait a minute, the food we just ate was for the poor, right? And you know, and we'd been in there not thinking anything about it, but how good it was. And he said, I've just eaten food that's been dedicated to the poor for serving the poor. He said, that's against my faith. And he insisted that we take some money that we could put into the fast offering for the food that he had taken and replace it. So these are, these are things that teach me I need to be thinking more deeply about what I believe and putting it into practice. The Muslim people uh, have a very structured uh, prayer ritual in their life. And they, they pray or before sunup. They are up praying. And various times throughout the day, they're praying. And I've had to ask myself, am I that dedicated? I pray every day but certainly not as much as my Muslim friends do and as, as fervently and obediently as they do every day. Uh, and I'm, uh, Judy this past Ramadan fasted. The, the Muslim people, all the, the daylight hours, uh, they fast during uh, the month of Ramadan. They do not eat uh, food or drink and they in, in, encourage each other to study the scriptures and to do good. It's a spiritual month that they have. And we see the difference. By, by the end of Ramadan, we see a glow coming from the, the Muslim communities. 
because those people are spiritually closer to God because of their discipline and dedication. Judy fasted uh, during the daylight hours, all of Ramadan. I wasn't that strong. I'm going to try it uh, this next time, but I think, and I ha that means I've got to get up before sunup and pray and, and start my fast. And I'm doing some, and asking myself, am I as dedicated in, in my uh, attempts to relate to my Father in Heaven as my Muslim neighbors are? So uh, I'm grateful for them because they're causing me to look into my own self and say, uh, I need to be better at, at my own faith. Thank you. Uh, I must say thank you very much, but many people are not praying. So I want to tell you that a lot of Muslims don't pray, unfortunately. <laughs> so don't think that, uh, that all of them are praying. <laughs> unfortunately. A few Mormons don't pray also, I think. <laughs> you know, they say that, that we should never compare our best with their worst. And, and sometimes we're comparing their best with our worst and making it, but we can all learn and grow together and be a support to one another. Time for one more question, please. In response to the last lady's question, is this happening anywhere else? I can tell similar stories from the Detroit area with the large uh, Arabic population in, in Dearborn, but I'm not on the program today. <laughs> well disciplined. Thank you. <laughs> but that's what a reception's for. So find him, grab him, break bread tonight at the reception, and uh, talk about Detroit and uh, interfaith work. That's at uh, 6.30 in 206. Please. I'm an LDS Christian glass artist, and I've been learning about Islam through um, the tradition of the 99 names. But in response to the earlier question about what are Mormons in Utah doing? Um, uh, friends of mine go to the Shia Mosque in South Salt Lake that was a converted, uh, that is a converted LDS meeting house. And one of the young men that I was visiting with said he was very happy that the Mormons kept just such good care of their buildings because that's the building that they use now. Um, several years ago, I went with a group of BYU students up to the Khadija Mosque and uh, they were very impressed with uh, the reception that they had. Um, this Ramadan, I, I was able to spend a, a couple evenings with a congregation. Uh, they invited me to listen to one of their imams, a uh, guest speaker, and uh, very subversive stuff. Talked about how important the family was. Um, he proved with the Quran that the Constitution of the United States was divinely inspired. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they made us feel so welcome that I, as I was uh, introducing myself to different uh, members of the congregation, there was a gentleman that I met who was also LDS, who had been biking by, wanted to know what the hubbub was about, and was invited in. And uh, he felt such, he uh, was made such a part of the uh, community that I thought he was a member. And uh, he evidently thought that I was a member as well. Well, all right, if you would join me in uh, giving Dr. Siddiqui and the Gillilands uh, a round of applause, and uh, we'll prepare for our next session. Thank you.